Buenas tardes, bienvenidos, gracias, gracias por la invitación a, a dar una plática aquí. Uh, ah, sorry. Um, <laughs> Normally used to giving talks here in C3 in Spanish, makes a change if you have to do it in English, so I'll stick with English. Um, I'm a postdoc here in, C3, here in C3, working with Dr. Chris Stevens uh, in the light side of complexity and health. And what I'm going to be talking about today is just a small part of, of the many projects that we've got here. Um, we're actually, we've got some posters out in the hallway as well, which are related to, to our work. Um, But today I'm going to be talking about self-perception of weight, um, what affects it and why is it important. If any of you here in the C3 saw me give a talk last year, then you probably think you've seen the talk on self-perception previously. But since then, we had a couple of articles published, uh, and this is an extension to that work, so we hope to have a couple more published as well. So a brief outline of the talk. Uh, I'm going to give a, a quick introduction to BMI, uh, to an FRS, which you'll find out about in a second. And I'll give a very brief refresher of the work of the talk that I gave last time before we dive into the new stuff. And the new things based in two studies, really, the first one is about education level and how that affects self-perception of weight. Um, that's here in Mexico using the, the ENSANUT data, the uh, National Survey of Health and Nutrition. Um, and we'll be looking at uh, the change in self-perception with education level. So how does accuracy and level of error improve with education? And does a higher education lead to more action taken? Because we can't just have knowledge. It's got to be actionable. It's got to be something we can do. And the second study then is self-perception in older adults, so uh, adults, uh, a database of adults here in Mexico, all aged 50 and, and above. But principally, I'll be talking about the differing question types and how that affects response to certain self-perception questions. Um, so a bit of background then. BMI, what is BMI? BMI is Body Mass Index, Indice de Masa Corporal in Spanish, um, which is very simply calculated by your, your mass, your weight in kilos, divided by your height in bed. So it's a very simple measure. Um, it's got its flaws, but it's universally accepted as a, as a general guide to classify weight status. Um, we can see here that the four principal ones are underweight, normal, overweight, and obese. In the range is marked there. So for me, for example, I am approximately 80 kilos, maybe after Christmas, a little bit higher than that. And I'm six foot three on the scale, which is one, uh, one meter 90. So if we come across there, I'm roughly in the middle of the, the normal range, which is pretty good. Um, that's just a rough guide. There are various other levels, so obesity, you can have obese stage one, which will be 30 to 35, 35 to 40, obese stage two, etc. Um, so that's what BMI is, just to bear that in mind for anybody. No, a refresher, if, uh, just to keep you up, updated. And then what is an FRS? An FRS is a figure rating scale, um, which looks something like this example here, and it's a method of determining self-perception of weight. So Present, uh, created by Stunkard in Denmark, I think in, in the early 90s. Uh, it's a method for determining self-perception. So all you need for this is to simply ask, which figure do you feel most represents you at this moment in time? And then the scale for women here and the scale for men down at the bottom. And then typically accompanied by the question, where on this scale would you like to be to determine a desired figure? No? So this is an FRS for any, sort of, uh, for any reference that I make to it. This is what, this is what I'm talking about. Um, a quick refresher of the, the talk that I gave last year then, uh, which, which was on, we've had two articles published. One that was looking at the effect of a medical opinion on self-perceptions of weight for Mexican adults. And the second one was uh, looking at an analysis of your real BMI, your self-perceived BMI, and your desired BMI using the figure rating scale I've uh, just shown. Um, a a one-slide summary of both articles, um, so don't expect uh, too much. But the effect of a medical opinion, what we saw in general was the underestimation in of weight is rife anyway in any population which agrees with all studies and the effect of a medical opinion will increase that. It won't make it perfect, but it does increase one's self-perception of their weight, which is fine for the overweight and the obese, so they're more closer to where, to where they are. But what we did see is that a perception of change is very low, not just um, the perception of where you are at this moment in time, but that people in general don't tend to perceive change. So. Maybe you go, oh, well, I think I've put a kilo on. You've probably put two on. That's what was the general, uh, the general result of the population using the, the Internet 2006 database. Um, and we relate this to a couple of cognitive biases. Well, this one particularly to the self-serving bias, which is we dabbled a little bit with the psychology, um, where good things are attributed, you, you attribute to one, to one, and negative things you attribute to external circumstances. So you might go, this week I've lost a couple of kilos, great. 
I was really strict with myself. I didn't go for tacos on Friday night. Everything was fine. I went to the gym. Well done me. But then maybe the next week you put those two, two kilos back on and you go, well, I, just, I had too much work to do. I didn't have time to go to the supermarket to cook. And I, just, I had to have tamales for, for breakfast. There's no option. So that's not my fault. Nothing to do with me. External factors. Um, the second thing that we saw, I, uh, an interesting point on the underestimation, well, the, <laughs> there were very few people in the data set who had been diagnosed as obese. So they'd been told by a medical professional, you are obese, heavily overweight, you need to do something about it. There's very few people who managed to return to a, a normal BMI. But of those people who did, all of them overestimated their weight. And this we attributed to something called the anchoring bias, which is where you stick to one point, one piece of information that you trust. So you go, no, well, the doctor told me that I was obese, and so I am. I might have lost a bit of weight, maybe I'm, o maybe I'm overweight, when they'd actually returned all the way back to a normal level. The second uh, article that I showed there uh, about real self-perceived and desired BMI confirmed almost everything that we did in the first one, but we had the, the addition of the, the desired BMI on the, on the, the desired figure, sorry, on the, on the figure rating scale, which showed us a good, uh, in general, people have a good idea of what a desirable figure is, what a normal, um, normal body shape should be, and that's where they want it to be, so that's pretty good. What you did see from this, though, is that a larger misperception leads to a higher degree of satisfaction. So if you have someone who is, who is obese, but they think that they're normal, then they're happy with that. They don't perceive any problem and they're satisfied with what they want to do. Uh, so they don't think they need to take any action. So a, a higher level of misperception leads to more satisfaction and therefore less action. Um, and what we propose from this is that uh, re a regular screening of weight and BMI uh, from a doctor would help to just constantly keep the, the perceptions that everybody has uh, updated and at a, at a more, more correct level. Um, because really to calculate somebody's BMI or determine if somebody is overweight, given the formula, you can do that in less than a minute. So stand on the scales, you weigh 80 kilos, how tall are you, 1 meter 90, your BMI is normal, you're, you're whatever. So that's what we propose from that. Okay, so that's the refresher. So let's go into the study now that we're, we're looking at. So what we want to look at here, as I mentioned, is education. Now, our hypothesis here is that a high level of education leads to a more accurate self-perception, which in turn leads to more action taken, because that's the idea, right? Now, we're not saying that education is an actionable variable. We're not saying that we can simply go, okay, those with higher education, let's give everybody a master's degree and everybody's going to be healthy. That obviously isn't going to work. But education itself is a proxy for many other contributing factors, so it's a way of looking at uh, 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 different variables, but, but it's what we take here. So education is linked potentially, not necessarily, but there's various literature on this, to a higher income, better access to healthcare, uh, exercise possibilities, uh, living conditions, stress, etc., etc. So that's what we're taking here as, as, a, as a potential fact. These are data from the, the National Health and Nutrition Survey again. Uh, this survey, I should mention, has uh, tens of thousands of people. Um, adults, teenagers, children, covers work life, home life, medics, etc., etc. Um, it really is massive. Um, once we've cleaned it up a little bit, we were left with 16,461, which is a pretty good number, with a ratio of 2 to 1 for, for women to men. So, uh, a quick breakdown then. Uh, we will base the, this study on a categorical question, so we weren't using the figure rating scale, um, which is simply, do you consider yourself underweight, normal, overweight, or obese? Four options, nothing else. One simple question, that's all. And then looking at the edu education levels, there was 14 possible options. Because of the way that the education system here in Mexico works, there's various things which are equivalent, carrera tecnica, uh, licenciatura, bachillerato, there's lots of stuff which I wasn't too sure about, but we split it up into six groups, which were which are these ones here. So that was education or kindergarten, uh, primary education, secondary education, college in the terms of like prepa here in Mexico, or sixth form college perhaps in, in, in England, just before going to university, which would be the undergraduate, and then the postgraduate studies at the bottom. There's only 52 there in the postgraduate, but still enough to warrant its own group given the results that we see. So. First thing to do then is to look at the difference between the average real BMI and the average perceived BMI based on these four groups. So the height and weight, calculate it and split it into some groups and then compare the difference between the two. So in each case, the, the actual BMI was higher than the perceived BMI. 
What we see here, though, is that as education is here along the bottom, that the difference between the perceived and real uh, decreases. So <clears throat> in dark green is men, and in light green is women. The men doesn't change much from about 0.65 down to about 0.48, but it was statistically significant. But for the women, there's quite clearly a huge change as education increases. So the difference here from, from about 0.8 of a category down to uh, 0.09, so almost nothing. So we are seeing there that education then does have an effect and it does increase to try and give a, a, a closer uh, self-perception of weight based on the categories that we've got there. Okay, but what about people who are correct, because that's on average. So these are people who have correctly identified themselves for, for each group. Here in this table, um, these are all the people, their actual BMI. So their actual BMI obese, the people who are actually overweight, the people who are actually normal, and then underweight. And these are the percentage of people who are correct in that group. What we see here with the obese is that nobody wants to say they're obese, which is relatively logical. There's obviously something existing there that they don't want to, they don't want to admit that. So that doesn't really change from 2 to, to 6%. But with the overweight, we go from 19.5% all the way up to two-thirds of, of the people in postgraduate. And if you say, well, there's not too many of them, there's still 57% um, in the undergraduate, which is still a lot more than 20. So the accuracy in, improves, certainly in the overweight group, um, as education increases. Okay, so what's then happening in the, with the obese group? So, in the table at the bottom, I don't know if it, at the back you can see this, but we've taken, of all, all, all the people in this table are the obese. So these are with a real BMI in the, in the obese range. And this is their self-perception, uh, the percentage of them that, that gave each one based on their, on their education. So as we know from the top table, uh, the obese line, nobody, nobody picks that. But what's then happening with the overweight and the normal? So all of these people are obese, so are they picking? Now, if you imagine this as having, if, you're, if you have a real BMI as obese, and you, you select obese as your perception, then that is a level of error zero. If you select uh, overweight, but you're really obese, that's one unit of error on the scale. And if you select normal, that would be two units of error, and underweight, three units of error. What we see then as education increases is that the... the the quantity of, of overweight people who do select, uh, sorry, the quantity of obese people who select the overweight category increases from 59.5% up to 86%. And in turn, the normal reduces from 39% down to 6.7%. So what it means is that a higher level of education, while they're not selecting the obese category, their level of error is reducing. So they're not selecting the normal, they are admitting to being overweight. What's clear from this is that there certainly exists a stigmatism in relation to the word obese. Nobody wants to be labelled as obese, so it doesn't matter what's going on. Nobody simply wants to admit that they're obese. That's right? fair enough. Um, and I was probably the same case with underweight, because underweight uh, and obese are certainly not, not any terms that, that people want to be. But education does increase uh, people accepting that they're at least overweight and therefore reduces the level of error. Um, well then, the next question logically is, does a more accurate self-perception lead to more action taken? Because it's okay to have a more accurate perception, but if nobody's doing anything about it, then it doesn't matter. So what we see here, and this graph is simply, well, thankfully, in the internet database, we can answer that question, because there did uh, include a section on weight loss, uh, which included the, the question, in the last year, have you lost or gained weight? And if you have lost weight, was this weight loss intentional? And the percentage of people who intentionally lost weight has increased from 6% to 25% as education increases. So while that's not perfect, there's definitely a, a huge increase, five-fold increase almost on, on, the, on the, the amount of people who have tried to lose weight given that. So what we see is that education in general gives uh, a more accurate self-perception, not perfect, but certainly more accurate, and that in turn leads to more action taken, which is great. Uh, a quick set of conclusions on, on this not just on this study, we see that it does have a positive effect, but mainly here, the word obese uh, has stigmatism attached to it, regardless of education level or, or, or of anything. But the good thing, higher education, more accurate, more action taken. Uh, it's important to remember that education is a proxy variable, but um, at least that can, for, uh, can help form uh, targeted interventions, right? which is uh, <clears throat> what all studies on health should be. So. Uh, the second study then, 
we're looking at different question types. We're doing this in a population of older Mexican adults. We used the Mexican Health and Aging Study from 2015 for this, where there's 935 adults aged 50 years and above. Um, within this wave, they took, uh, they measured height and weight, so we could calculate their real BMI. They were asked, uh, participants were asked to give a self-reported height and a self-reported weight from which we could construct a self-reported BMI. And also, there was a figure rating style question, uh, which was uh, allowed us to have two different types of questions compared to their, their real BMI. It's important to note here that the questionnaire was done first, and they were measured afterwards, so they couldn't just remember what had just been taken, because that would be pointless. Um, but that was the case, so that's good. A quick run through a couple of results here then. Comparing the measured BMI and the self-reported BMI, we divided these up into the four standard categories that I mentioned earlier. And generally, between measured BMI and self-reported BMI, based on self-reported height and weight, um, accuracy is pretty good, so surprisingly high. So for the measured obese, the people whose self-reported BMI was also in the obese range, that's a BMI greater than 30, was 74%, uh, which is pretty good. For the overweight, 70% uh, were correct, with 10% overestimating, 20% underestimating. And for normal, 80% were correct. So that's pretty good, right? So what happens then when you compare the measured BMI and the figure rating scale? So the figure rating scale within the literature, there's very things which say you can split those nine figures into this uh, distribution here, which is one, two, underweight, three, four, normal, five, six, seven, overweight, and eight, nine, as obese. So we're doing the same table with measured BMI and with the figure rating scale. Only 3%, 3.82% correctly identify themselves of the obese as obese using that scale. Now, equally, the numbers are, are, are lower, are much lower for, than previously, than, sorry, than the other question for overweight and for normal. But particularly in the obese, that's terrible, right? So if we had 74% previously and now we've got 4%, then that is a huge difference. Now, of course, there are pros and cons to all types of um, self-perception question. None of them are perfect. So with, as, we've been, as I mentioned previously, with the category question, the word obese or taking it as a label as obese, nobody wants to be accepted as obese. So there's a stigmatism which exists to that word. So there's already a flaw in the uh, category question. But it is a simple question, four answers, not, not too much to confuse there. With the uh, figure rating scale, well, it's a limited scale, right? Any scale with limits on, same as the category question, um, you're already putting limits on, on what somebody thinks. So you could take somebody who is obese, maybe just obese with a BMI 31, and they go, okay, so on this scale, where am I? So if nine is the maximum possible, well, I've got an uncle who's quite a quite a bit bigger than I am, so C is definitely bigger than I am. And I once saw a documentary about a guy who weighed 500 kilos, so on that scale, he must be number nine, right? So, and if he's number nine, then that would make my uncle seven, six, so I must be four. And you can justify that on a scale because there's always somebody bigger than you are, and therefore that in itself has a problem. When, on the base level of this scale, if everybody was truly honest, the only thing on a figure rating scale that you need is what you see in the mirror, nothing else. But psychologically, it definitely doesn't work like that. <clears throat> and then equally, with the self-reported height and self-reported weight, there's no limits on that scale. You can put whatever you want. If you had no idea what a kilo is or, or what a meter was, then you could just, you can say 700 kilos. I don't know what that'll do. But you can put that in there. Um, but generally, you would think most people would have an idea, maybe as a child, if somebody was measuring them. Uh, for example, now as they were growing, that, oh, well, I remember when I was 12, I was 1 meter 15, so I'm probably a bit more than that now, so you could maybe make a, an estimated guess. It's important to point out, though, that with, uh, in this table here, 74% are correct in the obese category, but that doesn't take into account, and it is something that we looked at in, in the article that we're writing at the minute, that um, <clears throat> it doesn't take into account that you can be very, you can underestimate heavily within the same category, particularly in the obese category. Because there is one, there's one person, I mean, he's, he's a bit of an outlier, but who has a BMI of 52, enormously morbidly obese. And his estimated height and weight came out at 32. So he's 20 BMI points out, <laughs> which is a huge amount, but he's correct in terms of category. Right? Obviously, in the obese, there's far more uh, possibility for, for extended uh, error within that. 
So there's pros and cons to all of them. But because of that, that's why it's important to take into account various different uh, questions. So final conclusions, final comment from me then is, uh, from the last study we've seen, underestimation of weight and BMI is generally universal. If you're older, if you're younger, doesn't matter, well-educated or not, underestimation is going to exist. The level of underestimation, though, does change. Um, the comparison using self-reported BMI uh, in the last bit gave us, did give us a different view because typically they are category questions or figure rating scale questions. Um, and what we propose from that then is definitely the, the word obese and in the figure is likely to have a more provoking effect than simply going, oh, your BMI is 50 and it's a number, doesn't matter. But if a doctor or anybody on medical professional was going to share, was going to show some, actually, this figure here is you, and this is an obese figure, then you need to do something about it. That's going to have much more impact and provoke a, a positive reaction, or, or hopefully provoke a positive change, than simply going, no, well, you weigh X amount. Because a number is a number on an infinite scale, and it doesn't really matter. Final comment for me, why is all this important? Well, self-perception then is, <laughs> if you don't perceive a problem, you can't act upon it. Because if you're happy with where you are and you don't think that there's any issue whatsoever, it doesn't matter. And all of the, the Secretary of Health and the, all the propaganda and marketing campaigns saying that you need to do exercise, you need to, you need to eat better, etc., etc. If you're not aware of the problem that you have, you're going to ignore all that completely. And so thousands, millions of pesos and dollars and pounds can be spent on these campaigns. But if you don't perceive a problem, you're not going to do anything about it. And that's why, uh, that's what we're doing this fucking. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you.